Good morning, and welcome to Webster Groves Christian Church, an open and affirming congregation of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. I'm Pastor Jeff Moore, and we're delighted that you're here with us, and we're delighted that you're here with us on Facebook as well. As we continue in this season of COVID, I have a few precautions and reminders to share with you. You notice that you came in through the center aisle, and we ask that you please leave through the side aisles when it's time to go. The ushers will have those doors open for you. Of course, in the case of an emergency, please exit through the nearest convenient exit. Also, please note that pews are marked off so that we can continue to social distance. Thank you for sitting with those in your COVID pod and for remaining masked and keeping the mask up over your mouth and your nose. You'll notice that we are handing out in the narthex small communion cups. These will contain uh, the bread and the juice that you'll need. Those of you at home, we hope that you'll have bread and juice or other items available so you can share in the Lord's Supper with us. We do invite you to sing here in the sanctuary, but we ask that you keep your mask on and sing gently. There will be times we'll invite you to stand if you're able, and um, one of those will be during the doxology. Again, you're invited to sing, but please leave your mask on during that time. We will not be pause, passing an offering plate, but there are offering baskets in the rear of the sanctuary on either side. And of course, we're grateful for any gifts that you give to the mission and ministry of Webster Groves Christian Church. You can also make gifts using our online app, GiveLify, or of course, by mailing or bank drafting a check or information. Again, we're grateful for your presence here and at home via Facebook. One more announcement before we begin worship, and that is that at the end of the narthex, you'll find on our coffee table um, lots of equal exchange coffee, and I believe we're having a closeout sale on that coffee right now, uh, so that each package of coffee that's labeled seven or eight dollars is available for three dollars and fifty cents uh, until it's gone. So I think there's some decaf, some hazelnut cream decaf, and some fully caffeinated coffee there. So if you'd like to get a bargain and help us support our equal exchange program, uh, please get some coffee uh, today or as soon as you're able. And then we'll replenish that, and then it's going to go back to the regular price. I invite you all to open your hearts and minds to the worship of our God. Sunday in Lent, we remember that you put all living things on your good earth and humans as caretakers. Your plan was that we would be able to rely on one another, 
as partners in our work, in our suffering and in our joy. Let your Holy Spirit soften our egos, open us up to equal partnering relationships that build up the body of Christ in our church family, at home, and in our communities. May your word resonate in our daily life and the blessings of Holy Communion enliven our work, what we say and what we do as partners together with guidance from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. time for a moment with the children. If there are children here and they'd like to come up and sit, they're welcome to come up. Otherwise, I will speak to you and to everyone. Well, as if you all want to stay seated, I've got a question, and that question is this. What does it mean for us to be people? What are people? I guess everybody in here is a person if we look around. And the Bible tells us something very important about people. That people are part of the earth, we live here on this planet, and that God made people. That God actually breathed God's spirit into the very first person, and then that person was all by themselves, and God said, you know what? People need to be together. And so God made a second person. When that second person was made, then the people were together. And now, of course, there are so many of us. But one of the things that God said when the second person was created is that second person could be a helper to the first one. And not just somebody to do whatever the first one says, but someone who was powerful enough to come to the aid of them. Somebody who could be around for them, that they could care for and that they could care for each other. So today... I want to remind everybody that we're people created by God, and it's good for us to be together. Of course, during COVID times, we've been apart in so many ways, but also 
we're made to help each other, to take care of each other. That's why God put people on the earth. Let's say a prayer. Holy One, thank you for creating the earth and for making people. Thank you that it's good that we're together and for giving us the strength to come to the aid of one another. We thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. From Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 9 and 15 through 25. The sovereign God crafted the human from the dust of the humus and breathed into its nostrils the breath of life. And the human became a living soul. And the sovereign God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there placed the human whom God had formed. Out of the ground the sovereign God may grow every tree pleasant to the sight and good for food, and the tree of life in the middle of the garden, along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The sovereign God took the human and settled it in the garden of Eden to till and tend it. Then the sovereign God commanded the human, from every tree of the garden you may eat freely, but the tree of the good knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you shall surely die. Then the sovereign God said, It is not good that the human should be alone. I will make it someone to rely on as its partner. Then the sovereign God crafted from the humus every creature of the field and every bird of the skies and brought them to the human to see what it would call them. And whatever the human called every living soul, that was its name. The human gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the human, there was not found one to re rely on as its partner. The sovereign God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the human, and it slept. Then took one of its sides and closed up its place with flesh in place of it. And the sovereign God built the side that had been taken from the human into a woman and brought her to the human. Then the human said, this time, this one is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one should be called a woman, for out of a man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his mother and his father and clings to his woman, and they become one flesh. And they were, the two of them, naked, the woman and the man, and were not ashamed. For the season of Lent, we're using a lectionary text suggested by Professor Wilda Gaffney of Bright University Divinity School. We're grateful for Wilda Gaffney's translations as well. These are her translations, and I'm very grateful here in this Genesis text, especially because um, she has made sure that we can see the pun in Hebrew on the ground from which the first person was created, and the first person. In the Hebrew, it is that ha-adam, the first person, is made from ha-adama, the ground. And Professor Gaffney has very helpfully used humus and human to show us that. There's something about us that connects with the dust of the earth. There's something, as we remember at the beginning of Lent, that's earthly about us. And there's something that is heavenly about us as well. God breathes God's spirit into the first human. But as I shared with the children and as we saw in this morning's scripture passage, it's not good for the human to be alone. And so the sovereign God creates another, a specific other. And again, I so appreciate Professor Gaffney's translation, a partner the human can rely on. This Hebrew word that's translated there, ezer, is often translated help in many places. But sometimes, especially when we um, assign gender to these two first humans, people have done a disservice to that understanding of helper. 
If we consider, as the text does not really say, that the first human was male, notice the text doesn't say that. We don't get that differentiation between male and female until after there are two of them. The first human is merely a human. After all, what would male or femaleness do or be about when there's only one of them? And yet, because it's important that human beings be together and express relationship, the second human is made by God. And the word helper is used. Biblical translators and interpreters over the year have said, ah, yes, if we say that the second one that was made was the woman, it figures that she would be a helper. You know, that's what women are supposed to do, help men. They're supposed to hold stuff for us and go where we tell them to go. Uh, like, hold my beer. I'm going to do something important, etc., etc. And unfortunately, that's really not a helpful, pun intended, translation. In fact, that word that we find there is used again and again and again in the Hebrew Bible, helper, and often translated that way. But guess who the helper is in those other Hebrew Bible texts? God. God is my helper. God helps the poor. God helps the widow. God helps the orphan. God help us because the hordes are coming in to invade our land. God, please be my helper in this time of trouble. I can't imagine feeling any overtones of God, you're my junior assistant. God, hold my beer while I take care of this important work. No. God, be a divine partner that I can rely on. God, because you have power and strength of your own. God, because your volition is trustworthy and true. God, because you are important, I long for you to be in my life. If God says that it's not good for one human to be alone, if it's true that we should live in partnerships, they certainly should be partnerships of reliance. Not partnerships where one partner says, I'm better, and the other partner hears or even, God forbid, believes, I am less so, but rather partnerships of mutual care, love, and support. This is what God has designed. This is what it means. And again, I'm so grateful to Professor Gaffney for this translation. A partner upon whom we can rely. Partnerships are mutual reliances. Partnerships are not only alliances, but they are opportunities to be reliant upon one another. Knowing that when the chips are down, knowing that when life is hard, knowing that when there's difficulty and trouble, there is somebody else in our lives who cares for us, who reaches out to us, and who can be there. That's incredibly important. Now, I know that that can be important in our own lives as we gather together as partners in very many different ways. We can have lifelong covenanted partnerships like marriages. We can have friendships that are so important to us. We can be siblings or biologically connected in some other way. And those partnerships are there too. And hopefully, they're partnerships of reliance. Hopefully, they're partnerships where we share mutual affection, respect, and where we know that the other can rely upon us and we can rely upon those others. Indeed, sometimes we use the word love when we talk about such partnerships of reliance. We were reading 2 John in the Seekers class this morning. It didn't take us long. It's only 13 verses. Um, but still, Donna, you get credit. You read an entire biblical book this morning out loud. And in the gospel, rather the second letter of John, we hear about the importance of walking in love. And we remarked that love isn't just sentimentality. Love is something that you do. Love is something that connects you to other people in a certain way. Love is about partnerships of reliance. To just say, I love you, is lovely is sentimental, is nice, sometimes it's even cute, it can be very romantic, but what if one says I love you and refuses to walk in love with you? 
What if someone says, I love you, and yet you have not formed and forged a partnership of reliance? But Genesis tells us that in this world that God creates, in this world where the sovereign God breathes God's breath and spirit into the first human, we are created not to be alone, but to be engaged in partnerships of reliance. Now that's great for two-person partnerships and can also be true of multi-person partnerships. What about our congregation? What about our expression of this part of the Christian faith? Are we engaged in partnerships of reliance? Do we understand fully the power, the importance, the giftedness of each other member of the body of Christ? I hope so. Because this partnership of reliance that we call a congregation is a gifted community. We have opportunities to share our love, to share our talents, to share our time, and to receive from others the gifts that they bring. I'm so glad that we're blessed with such a partnership. As I look at you and as I think about those who may be joining us on Facebook, I'm aware of all of the different stories that make up who we are, all of the different skills that we bring to the table, this table, the table of our Lord. I think about all of the history and all of the future that we share together, and it makes me happy to know that we are in a partnership of reliance. Now, this can spread beyond our congregation to our communities and even to the nations of the world, and that's where we run into trouble when people forget that human beings were created for partnerships of reliance, when people forget what it means to share mutually with one another, things go badly, things go wrong. That's how we get, for instance, gender discrimination. When people don't understand that we're made as partners to rely upon one another, that's how we get discrimination based on sexuality or gender expression. When people forget that we're made to be mutually caring for one another and to exist in partnerships of alliance, that's where we get racism and classism and sexism. That's where we get international violence. Unfortunately, all nations at one time or another seem to be guilty of misunderstanding what it means to exist in the world with other human beings as partners who can rely upon one another. Certainly our own nation has been guilty of this time and time again. This morning as I was coming to church, I was reminded on television of all of the refugees from Ukraine who are moving into Hungary and Poland I was reminded as well of all of the refugees from Yemen and Syria and Somalia and Ethiopia and Nicaragua and El Salvador and so many other places over the years, over the weeks, over the months. When these refugee situations happen, it seems that they are a symptom of a problem a deeply rooted problem, the failure to see other human beings as partners that we extend mutual care with, partners created because the human should not be alone, partners upon whom we can rely. If we're going to have partners we can rely upon, we have to be reliable partners. I'm going to say that again. If we're going to have partners we can rely upon, we have to become reliable partners. Theology is at stake here, something about how we understand God. This text reminds us that to be human is to be of the earth, human from the humus. Again, thank you, Professor Gaffney. To be human is also to be God-breathed, to have a spirit, to be a living soul, and to live in mutual, reliant partnerships one with another. Some of those partnerships are close and intimate and long-lasting. 
we thank and praise God for the gift of those partnerships. When one human and another human confess their love to one another and walk together in covenant. But those aren't the only partnerships of reliance to which we are called. We're called to see each other as humans of the humus, as earthlings together. We're called to see each other as God-breathed living souls. We're called to see each other as partners upon whom we can rely. And then by God, says Genesis, we must live as reliable partners. The first way to do that, I guess, is to see the humanity in each other. Think of all the ways we dehumanize each other in this world. All the ways that we say that somebody is not as good or as capable or as true or as real or as valid. That's theological malpractice according to Genesis and according to what our Lord and Savior Jesus taught. And think of all the opportunities we miss. It's not good for the human to be alone. We are called to community, to mutual community. What do you have to bring as a reliant partner to this community? Think about the attitudes, the gifts, the experience, the hope, the faithfulness that you can bring to reliable partnerships with others. And know that you're not being asked to go above and beyond, what you're being asked to do, what I'm being asked to do, what we're being asked to do is to be human. To be human together with one another. Sometimes being a reliable partner means standing up, standing with, standing forth. Sometimes being a reliable partner means having an open heart and open ears, and sometimes a closed mouth. Sometimes being a reliable partner just means being there. Humans, it's not good for us to be alone. We are called to be partners that we can rely upon. If you now are walking in a covenanted partnership with another human, God bless you and God bless that partnership. Be reliable for one another. Remember that there's no junior partner. That you've been yoked together and you've covenanted to walk together in life. Celebrate that. Receive it. It's a gift of love. If you are living in partnership with friends and siblings and other family members and communities, God bless those relationships. Those are relationships that are important. I believe they are God-breathed and God-gifted relationships. And remember, there are no junior partners in those relationships. There are to be relationships of mutuality, care, and love. As you look to the world that seems so big sometimes and that others so small, remember that every other human in every other place is called to be a partner with you, to be relied upon and upon whom are a brother that can rely upon you as well. God creates us. God gives us one another in this world. We are humus. We are spirit-breathed, living souls, and we are called to walk together in partnerships of reliance, mutual care, and love. Amen. If you're worshiping with us this morning and you hear the word of the scripture that's shared, if you believe that we are human beings filled with spirit and you feel called to be a part of this community or a disciple of Jesus Christ, we invite you to join us at Webster Groves Christian Church by reaching out to us and sharing and praying with us.
The season of Lent has begun. As we walk this Lenten journey, we are mindful that indeed we are humans from the humus. And we are mindful that we are spirit-breathed living souls. We are called together, people of the earth and people of the spirit, to gather at this table where all are welcome, no matter who you are or where you come from, no matter how your day began or what you're looking forward to, this is a table to which you are invited. It is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, a place to bring our fears and our hopes, a place to gather and to find sustenance. All are invited to the table of our Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, we come to your table in remembrance of your Son, Christ Jesus. We come also reaffirming our desire for a closer communion with you and with one another. May the elements of this communion give us strength so that we might live as Christ lived, a life of service to others. May it give us faith that is firm enough to keep from falling and flexible enough to meet the needs of each new day. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. Remember now with me the story of our faith, that on the night in which he was betrayed, Christ took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to those who were gathered and said, this is my body broken for you, do this in remembrance of me. In a like manner, after the supper, he also took the cup. He blessed it, giving thanks to God. He gave it to them, saying, Take, drink. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. I invite you now to partake of the elements. <laughs>
loving God, we're grateful that you have gathered us at this table, the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, where we have encountered the bread and the cup and our Lord and one another. Strengthen us that we may continue to walk forward, relying on you, O God, and partnering with one another in great partnerships of reliance. We thank and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we come to a time of community prayer, we're mindful that today we are also praying for the people of Ukraine and for the people of Kenya, with which we have many partnerships in mission. Now, are there those who have prayer concerns and joys to share? If so, raise your hand and you can remain masked and I will bring the microphone to you and I'll hold the microphone. Who has prayer concerns? Uh, 62 years ago, I met, fell in love with, and began wooing a college freshman. It took me two years to convince her to marry me, but she did. I have walked in love with her for coming up on 60 years. We have shared a partnership which has blessed me, has blessed our children, and everyone she has ever known. So I congratulate my lovely wife, on her upcoming 80th birthday, day after tomorrow. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> Joniel, does Janie know about this college freshman you were wooing? <laughs> Are there other joys and concerns? I want us to continue to pray for Chris Webb, who is recovering from surgery. And of course, we want to continue to keep the Gerdes family in our prayers as well. There are other joys and concerns this morning. Of course, we've mentioned the people of Ukraine, many of whom are now refugees, others of whom are staying in their homes uh, to stand and to fight. We pray for peace on this earth in all places at all times. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, for the people of Kenya, the people of Ukraine, and all humans created from the humus and breathed with your spirit, we give you thanks and we ask for your help, your aid, your presence. We're grateful, O oh God, for our sister Janie and for her 80 years of life, and for Joe Neal and Janie and their strong and long partnership. We ask that you bless relationships, O oh God, those that are covenanted for lifetime, those that include deep friendships and memories, those of family and congregations and gathered communities. We thank you, God, that you call us to make them partnerships of mutual care and reliance. We ask, O oh God, that you bless this world and that you touch our hands, that we might be a part of your blessing in the world. Open our hearts, that we may show compassion and walk in love. And open our mouths, that we speak words of peace and condolence and respect and hope. We pray these and all things in the name of Jesus, our Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
And now people of God, humans from the humus, God breathed living souls, go forth from this place to partner and rely upon God and to be reliable and reliant partners with all those whom you meet. Go forth in the name of our God who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen. Thank you.